Bible and look at the book of James. While you're turning there, trying to give you a little rundown on him. I think we did this the last time we looked at James, but uh, they sound like they're having a good time, aren't they? In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, and 7, we learn uh, that Jesus made a special trip to specifically see James, his, his brother, his half-brother. Uh, so upon the return, uh, uh, after the resurrection says, uh, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. So specifically the scripture, the apostle Paul tells us that James said that he specifically saw Jesus after the resurrection. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 19 we read. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither when I went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but when I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus, then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now you know James, it took him a while to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Um, and so after the resurrection, it's you know we read that Jesus came specifically to James. And then we read here in Galatians where Paul was telling them that after he had his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, you know he, he you know three years or so went by and he goes to Jerusalem and he sees James there. And so James is progressing, we read. Uh, chapter 2 and uh, verse 12, it says here in, in Galatians, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So there's another reference. Acts 12, 7 is another uh, reference. And this tells us that he has progressed even more. Uh, Acts 12, 7 says, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. He smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell from off his hands. Y'all remember this. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. Let's see, where am I getting to on this one? Going to 12. Verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Let's see. Somewhere in there it tells us that James was in there. I think I've already passed it. 12, 17. There it is. Go show these things to James and unto the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Anyway, I've run these references because I wanted you to kind of get a feel <coughs> for how James had progressed in his 
uh, walk with Christ. And no doubt, he probably had some features like Jesus, wouldn't you think? Since they were half-brothers. I mean, they had the same mother. And so um, he probably had some features like Jesus. So he probably became fairly popular. You know, he was the pastor of the church there in Jerusalem and stayed there even. So uh, as, as we think about this, um, think about what James probably believed. Think about how strong he was in his faith. Also, uh, we, we learn from Josephus, he was a first century historian, that James was martyred around A.D. 62. And so he even followed his faith all the way to the, to the death. And so this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. All right, and what we want to do here is read chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. It's been a little while since I've done it. I don't even know that I've done this before. But anyway, um, and then we're going to go back and go through these because... Uh, I have the notes here from Matthew Henry, uh, which is a commentary, and he has some really good things to say about these verses. And so we can do that and talk on them some if you want to. All right? So. <clears throat> it says, This is called a general epistle because, as some think, not directed to any particular person or church, but such a one as we call a circular letter, the design of it is to reprove Christians for their great degeneracy, both in faith and manners. And here's the part that really spoke to me. It was also a special intention of the author of this epistle to awaken the Jewish nation to a sense of greatness and nearness of those judgments which were coming upon them and to support all true Christians in the way of their duty under the calamities and persecutions they might meet with. And so that is what spoke to me about what he was trying to say with these things because it's my understanding in Scripture that the farther along we go, the greater the possibility for persecutions to come our way. Um, and so these things can very well prepare us for what we could be about to face. Okay? So let's begin in verse 1 and go through verse 12. Uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting... My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. And let, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich, rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. All right. Verse 1, let's look and see what he says. Uh, it says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. All right. Verse 1, it is often the lot, even of God's own tribes, to be scattered abroad. We should not despond to think ourselves rejected under outward calamities. God remembers and sends comfort to his scattered people. 
So I guess what this is telling us is when we go through tough times, we're supposed to keep our chin up because everybody goes through tough times. And God has a message for these people as they're going through tough times, difficult times, being scattered abroad. Um, and this could be after the persecution that arose uh, after the ascension, when the church began. Uh, as a matter of fact, James being basically the pastor of that church, you know, Jerusalem, the Christians in Jerusalem came under great persecution there uh, after the ascension. So, uh, we should not despond to think ourselves rejected under outward calamities. God remembers and sends comfort to his scattered people. All right, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. All right, here's his comment. The suffering state of Christians in this world is represented. It is implied that troubles and afflictions may be the lot of the best Christians. Such as have a title to the greatest joy may yet endure very grievous afflictions. And here's the one I quoted Sunday night, uh, Kate Ann. The trials of a good man are such as he does not create to himself, nor sinfully pull up upon himself, but they are such as he is said to fall into. In other words, uh, a lot of times the messes that we find ourselves in is not anything that we've done. It's just problems that arise that we have to deal with. Uh, like we said Sunday night, oftentimes we have to suffer the consequences of other people's sin. And that's what this is talking about. Uh, the trials of a good man are such as he does not create to himself, nor sinfully pull upon himself, but they are such as he is said to fall into. All right. <clears throat> What's the difference in grace and a grace? That's the question I ask myself. One Christian grace is to, to be exercised is joy. So what is a grace? What is a Christian grace? Right? We know what grace is. Right? Grace, I looked it up, an instance or manifestation of favor. This is the dictionary's uh, uh, definition. One Christian grace to be exercised is joy. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. So that is a grace. One Christian grace to be exercised is joy. We must not sink into a sad and disconsolate frame of mind which would make us faint under our trials. A lot of times I tell, you know, I tell my kids, I tell somebody, you know, keep your chin up. Walk around all sullen up. Keep your chin up. God expects us to do that. And it helps us. Um, and when he calls it a grace, I really thought on that because it's only by his grace that he has allowed us to live this far. Whatever comes our way. Life, whether we have good times or bad times, life as a whole is a gift. Because we deserve death immediately. Upon the first sin, we deserve death. Uh, actually, upon Adam's sin. So when you carry it all the way back, we shouldn't even be here. So when you look at grace under those circumstances or under that light, it is a grace that he allows us to even suffer persecution. And so even during those, uh, during those times, if we can learn to remember that we're only here by his grace anyway, it is oftentimes a blessing to have the opportunity to suffer and learn the blessing that comes from it. And so that's where he's going with this. One Christian grace to be exercised is joy. We must not, must not sink into a sad and disconsolate frame of mind which would make us faint under our trial. Uh, here's another one I marked. Philosophy may instruct men to be calm under their troubles, but Christianity teaches them to be joyful. 
Isn't that good? Philosophy may instruct men to be calm under their troubles, but Christianity teaches them to be joyful. So be joyful during your troubles. Okay? There is the more reason for joy in afflictions if we consider the other graces that are promoted by them. Interesting. Read it again. There is more reason for joy in afflictions if we consider the other graces that are promoted by them. And this is under verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Okay. Verse 3. Faith, verse 3, and then also in verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. All right, faith, there must be a sound believing of the great truths of Christianity and a resolute cleaving to them in times of trial. Difficult times are absolute. They simply are. And the sooner we come to realize that, the sooner we'll be able to face them with joy. Malia mentioned it a while ago. You know, my brother died. He was 48. Younger than me. When he passed away. He passed away in 2012. And, uh, oh, wow, it broke our hearts. You can imagine, you know. He was the youngest one. And, uh, and then Dawn, my sister, passed away. In 2017. And, uh, Malia mentioned again today, as a matter of fact, about when she was sitting by mother, and mother said, well, God is still good. You know? And how can you do that when you're buried your second child and your husband's already passed away? God is still good. And I think, now that's, that's an example for us, you know. Let's just keep, their, keep our head on straight about life, because, you know, we're all... We're, we're all going to face death one day for sure. I mean, it's just obvious. It's going to happen. Just go ahead and accept it. And, uh, and, and the same thing with difficult times. The same thing with calamities. And that's what, uh, that's what they were saying here, uh, or what Matthew Henry was saying here about this book in, in, as a whole. Uh, you're you're going to face these persecutions um, there must be a sound believing of the great truths of Christianity and a resolute cleaving to them in times of trial. There must be. If you're going to be a Christian, there must be a sound believing of the great truths of Christianity and resolute cleaving to them in times of trial. All right. The trying of one grace produces another. Isn't that good? Verse 3, patience. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So the trying of one grace produces another. To exercise Christian patience aright, we must let it work. Isn't that good? To exercise Christian patience aright, we must let it work. The trying of one grace produces another. All right, Stoical apathy. Now, I had to look those two words up. Stoical means indifferent to pleasure and pain. Self-control. Apathy is a lack of interest or desire for activity. Indifference. So let's just say indifference. Stoical apathy or indifference and Christian patience are very different. Um... By the one men become in some measure insensible of their afflictions, but by the other they become triumphant in and over them. Let us give it leave to, uh, to work. Let us give patience leave to work, and it will work wonders in a time of trouble. We must let it have its perfect work. And this is verse 3. Knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. Um, you were talking about the death a while ago, and it reminded me of what you know what Daniel said when his son died. You know, he said, "Yeah, whether you live or whether you die, you know, he couldn't do nothing." He said, 
He can't come back unto me, but I can go to him. That's right. Yep. King David. Yep. Sure was. Um, have you ever, I know you have, but when you're in a really difficult time and you're in that stage of just waiting, I'm just waiting for it to get better. It's tough, and I don't like it, and I'm just sitting here having to wait. And that that is learning to be patient. And sure enough, after enough time passes, things begin to get better. And we learn to cope with them more so as we learn to do that waiting. <clears throat> All right. When the work of patience is complete, then the Christian is entire and nothing will be wanting, verse 4. When the work of patience is complete, then the Christian is entire, and nothing will be wanting. All right? But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, you can reach a point where you are a patient person. Let patience have its perfect work. When you get there, it doesn't matter what you face. You will learn to face it with patience and wait on the Lord to do his thing. Right? Sometimes it may take longer than other times, but I have learned to wait upon the Lord. And after time passes, things begin to get better. And sure enough, his spirit does a work in my heart. And then I'm feeling that, that joy again. All right, verse 5, prayer. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. All right, prayer. What we ought more especially to pray for is wisdom. You ever pray for wisdom? We should. We should pray for wisdom. Wisdom comes from the Father. He's the one that gives wisdom. All right, we should not pray so much for the removal of an affliction as for wisdom to make a right use of it. Man, that hits home, doesn't it? When we're facing something difficult, and we very well might face some pretty bad stuff before we leave this place. Right? There's no way we, I don't believe any of us could compare. But, you know, you think back to Job. Yeah. His wife told him to just curse God and die. He know with it. Yeah, because it was so bad. Lost everything he had in a very short time. And he was wealthy. Amen. We should not pray so much for the removal of an affliction as for wisdom to make a right use of it. Isn't that something? Father, I know you've got something for me here to learn. So help me to learn it. Hmm. All right. To be wise in trying times is a special gift of God. In what way this is to be obtained upon our asking for it? To be wise in trying times is a special gift of God. You ever known anybody like that? You know they're going through a difficult time, but they seem to handle it so well. You know, that person likely has been praying for wisdom. And he's learned to be patient. Okay? All right. Let the foolish become beggars at the throne of grace. And they are in a fair way to be wise. Let the foolish become beggars at the throne of grace. And they are in a fair way to be wise. Okay. All right. Verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 6. There's not, there is one thing necessary to be observed in our asking. There must be no wavering, no staggering at the promise of God through unbelief. You ever heard of the sin of unbelief? Yeah, unbelief is a sin. The sin of unbelief. So it is very necessary to ask in faith as we, as we pray. All right. Also, it says sincerity of intention and a steadiness of mind constitute another duty required under affliction. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind 
and tossed. Uh-oh. Sincerity of intention and a steadiness of mind constitute another duty required under affliction. Sincerity of intention and steadiness of mind. It says, to be sometimes lifted up by faith and then thrown down again by distrust. This is very fitly compared to a wave of the sea that rises and falls, swells and sinks, just as the wind tosses it higher or lower, that way or this. The success of prayer is spoiled hereby. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. If you're going to flip-flop, pray without faith, and just the next day get up and, you know, grumble about the same thing again, and then, you know, not have faith that the Lord's going to answer the prayer, and then go back and pray it again, and then grumble again, and, you know, the Lord's not going to answer this prayer. You know, that's what it's talking about here. Um, such a distrustful, shifting, unsettled person is not likely to value a favor from God as he should do. And therefore cannot expect to receive it. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. It says a wavering faith and spirit has a bad influence upon our conversation. Verse 8. When it says conversation, it means about the way we live our lives. Verse, uh, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable. In all his ways. All right. All right. There will be great unsteadiness in all our conversation and actions. He that is unstable as water shall not excel. All right, verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice. In that he is exalted. It says both poor and rich are directed on what grounds to build their joy and comfort. Verses 9 through 11. All right. Those of low degree are to be looked upon as brethren. Good Christians may be rich in the world. Verse 10. Grace and wealth are not wholly inconsistent. Both these are allowed to rejoice. No condition of life puts us out of a capacity of rejoicing in God. Rich or poor, right? No condition of life puts us out of a capacity of rejoicing in God. All who are brought low and made lowly by grace may rejoice in the prospect of their exaltation at the last in heaven. So at least we always know that we're headed in that, uh, we're going to receive that, uh, that promise. We always have that to look forward to. All right, verse 10 says, but the rich. Can you say that verse again about the condition of life? Yeah, let's see here. No condition of life puts us out of a capacity of rejoicing in God. Yep, no condition of life puts us out of a capacity of rejoicing in God. Verse 10, But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. What reason rich people have to be humble? As the flower of the grass he shall pass away. He and his wealth with him. Verse 11. Verse 11, as a flower fades before the heat of the scorching sun, so shall the rich man fade away in his ways. For this reason, let him that is rich rejoice, not so much in the providence of God that makes him rich, as in the grace of God that makes him keep, makes and keeps him humble. You know, the Bible teaches that God is the one that gives the man power to get wealth. So when we realize that, uh, even when we do well and become wealthy, uh, we realize that it's by his grace that we have that. 
It's not wrong to be wealthy. <laughs> not wrong at all. But you can be wealthy and let it ruin you too, right? All right. A blessing, verse 12. I think this is the last verse, right? Yeah. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. All right, a blessing is pronounced on those who endure their exercises and trials. It is not the man who suffers only that is blessed, but he who endures. Hmm. I thought that was pretty good. Here's another good, good statement. Afflictions cannot make us miserable. A blessing may arise from them. <laughs> wow. Who likes afflictions? I don't like afflictions. <laughs> when we look at them like those things that God uh, is going to allow us to learn a lesson from, uh, it helps, right? All right, sufferings and temptations are the way to eternal blessedness. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life when he is approved. When his graces are found to be true and of the highest worth. Here's another good statement. The tried Christian shall be a crowned one. I like that. We only bear the cross for a while, but we shall wear the crown to eternity. The blessedness is a promised thing to the righteous sufferer. All right. Our enduring temptations must be from a principle of love to God and to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so... The grace of God makes and keeps us humble during our trials and afflictions. We talked about afflictions. We talked about suffering. We talked about temptations. We talked about the tried Christian. right? And we can all probably identify with those things at some point or another. You know, just through counseling, I can go around the room and remember a lot of things that a lot of you guys have been through. Right? The crown of life is promised to all those who have the love of God reigning in their hearts. Right? Okay. Through these afflictions, these sufferings, temptations, being tried, uh, these are a providence of God. He, by His grace, is allowing us to live our life and learn these lessons through these sufferings. What's the alternative? Take us out of it. Or never have given us the opportunity to live. The opportunity we have to live life is a blessing. You know, just think of, think of those that had their lives cut off short. You know, Never got to the joys that we have. Alright, any comments before we stop? The things that we learn in this life, though, I believe with all my heart, I believe the Lord has a plan for each one of us, and that plan goes beyond this life. And, and what we learn from this side is going to have an influence on our eternity. Um, you know, we're not going to be idle by any means on the other side. And he'll know us and, and uh, understand. So these opportunities that we have... To, to grow through these difficult times are, are useful. And uh, it would be wise of us to, to view it that way. It's what James is trying to tell us. All right. Any other comments? Thank you, Brother Kozad. Any other comments?
come back uh, the camel can do an hour with ease. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, there are so many things that can stand in the way of a rich man that a poor man never has to deal with. Mm -hmm. A lot of temptations that money brings. Yeah. They begin to put their faith in their money instead of in the Lord. Well, it's five after. We're going to have to get started hauling young ones here in a minute. So there's no other comment. Anything? Let's uh, stand. We'll be dismissed. Amen. Uh, John, if you would dismiss us, please. Uh, let's pray. Thank you. Through the Father, we just thank the Lord for this day, Lord, you give us. Lord, we thank the Lord for this time to come, Lord, and just uh, pray the worship to you, Lord, just uh, open your word. Lord, we ask the Lord to be with everybody, Lord, and we go our different ways. In Christ's name, amen. 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 It's only one stick.